Hey everyone, okay, so today we're covering uh, six methods for measuring strength and hypertrophy progress. So, for measuring progress, what we will be discussing, well, as the title page says, this is going to be both relevant for strength and physique goals. Now, in terms of measuring progress, it's not going to be the usual of your thinking of getting a DEXA scan or body weight or things like that. More so, we're looking at how can we quantify progress via your performance in the gym, which for one, for strength goals, obviously, if you're getting stronger, you're getting stronger. If your numbers are going up, then obviously you're progressing. For physique goals, muscle, muscle hypertrophy, is a byproduct of performance. So, firstly, your performance is going to go up. You're going to be handling more training volume. Uh, you're going to be getting stronger over a range of rep ranges. So, if you're getting stronger over rep ranges of 10, 8, 6s, 4s, if you just find your strength is increasing, well, then this is a really good sign that you are gaining muscle. So, Rather than use more kind of subjective measures or how I'm looking, which I do have value, I do believe in taking you know regular photos, uh, but sometimes it can be a bit subjective. Uh, also, when you're using things like the uh, DEXA scans and uh, the the in body scans, there are inaccuracies in that if you're doing it at different times of the day, if you're carbohydrate depleted, how much water you drank, all these things can affect the end result that they give. So in this presentation I'm doing, we're going to use more numbers and your performance because as I mentioned, if your performance is a good is going up, well obviously you're getting stronger, so strength goals are easy. And then secondly, if your performance is going up, you're probably looking a lot better as well. So the first important thing before I go through all of the max methods, it is very important that you have some exercises which are consistently always in your training program. Common issue that I always see in the gym is people are doing different exercises each week. If you're changing up your exercises each week, you're not getting a chance to adapt to those exercises. And then furthermore, for the point of this presentation, how are you going to measure your progress if you're always chopping and changing stuff? So we want to have uh, some exercises in our program, kind of like our core movements that are always in the program. So for powerlifting, this is easy, because you're always going to be doing the comp lifts. You're always going to be doing a squat, bench press, and deadlift. However, for those who uh, have no... Um, I can't think of the word that I want to use. No interest of competing in powerlifting, they just want to generally get stronger. Or for bodybuilders who don't necessarily have to or want to perform squats and, and deadlifts... You don't have to do these movements, okay? They are they are very good movements, but you don't necessarily have to do them. But you should select some exercises which are relevant to your goals and what you enjoy and potentially work around injuries. Some people, maybe when they squat or deadlift, they just always get really beat up and always hurting their back or hurting their knees and whatnot. So they just have to, and then it's fine, they don't get kind of, they can't string training blocks together because they just kept getting getting injured and they just don't like those exercises, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to do squats, deadlifts, bench presses. But I've done a little, this isn't like a full extensive list, I'm just giving you some examples. So again, these are for kind of more the, the general strength and bodybuilders. Some core movements that you may pick which are consistently always in your program so you can measure progress, which I'm going to go over after this. 
for leg extension movements, like you might do a hack squat, uh, stick leg deadlift, leg presses, a hip hinge. You might do a hex bar deadlift instead of regular deadlift. Hip thrust, like if your goal, hip thrust, if your goal is to get more for the, the females, and the guys don't say anything wrong with this too, if you just want to get really good glutes, the hip thrust is going to be one of the best exercises to improve glute size and hypertrophy. So I would suggest that hip thrust is going to be one of the core movements that you are going to do. Because if your hip thrust strength is going up, well guess what? Your butt is probably looking a lot better. Um, so again, back movements, you might do T-bar rows, penlay rows, bent over rows, shoulders, overhead press, a dumbbell, shoulder press, uh, chest. Again, you don't have to do a bench press. You might prefer doing an incline press, um, a dumbbell press. I didn't even put maybe even you might do a, a machine press. However, with all these movements, you have to maintain consistency in your form. So what do I mean by that? In in powerlifting, you for the squat, obviously there's a certain depth that you have to make. You have to achieve in a full lockout. Okay, so there is consistency in the technique. If you're using like a leg press, for example, make each repetition consistent. So when you're testing this exercise over time, the it's it's always, you're always doing the same type of rep. So for the leg press, what I do when I'm leg pressing, and I think what most people should do, is I will set the stopper at a point that I'm getting a full range of motion, okay? I will bring the plate down, I'll bring my legs down all the way till the plate hits the stopper, I do a dead pause, and then I will push up. Then I know my repetition, the, the, the range of motion of my repetition is the, exactly the same each time. Another common issue in the gym is people will load the leg press up with lots and lots of weight, and then their range of motion gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So, as I say down here, are you getting stronger because you're getting stronger or because you're making the lift easier? Are you getting stronger on the leg press because your legs are getting stronger or is it because you're, you know, reducing the range of motion? So, keep some sort of consistency. One more example that I'll give you is a, a bent over row. So, what you can do if you want to maintain consistency in that, how I would do this is I would do a bent over row in the squat rack. I would set the stoppers at the range where my arms are going to be full extension. Okay, so when I'm doing my row, the bar is from a kind of dead stop. I know it's in the same range of motion each time. I'm going to bring it up till it touches kind of like my, my stomach or around my belly button area, wherever the bar comes up in a bent over row on you, okay? touches the rack at the start, touches my belly at the end, and I am not swinging. I am maintaining consistency in my technique every time I do the movement. So this is going to be very important in these core movements which you select, which you are going to be measuring performance on to see if you're progressing. So, the first common method that all of us know, but I'm going to just go over some things to consider, is just maximum strength testing. So this is just like doing like a one rep max, okay? However, you don't have to perform a one rep max. You might do a one RM, you might do a three RM, you might do a five RM, you might do an eight RM, okay? You don't necessarily have to do a one rep, a one rep max test. And I'll explain why. So, especially for powerlifters, or just for everyone in general, peak strength, like as in one rep max, your, your one rep max, peak strength may only happen a few times a year. You can't expect to PR your one, one RM all year round. So, if you've been doing like a, a volume block where your repetitions are higher, you're doing like 8s and 10s, well, you may be getting stronger in the 8 and 10 rep ranges because you're accumulating volume, but you might find that your 1RM, your, your, yeah, sorry, your 1RM might actually drop a little bit 
because you're just not training in those lower rep ranges, okay? So if you did like back-to-back -back volume blocks, let's say you did say four volume, volume blocks uh, in a row, you tested your one RM before those volume blocks, okay? And then you, and you say you squatted 160 kilos, all right? And then for whatever reason, you just kept doing volume, volume, volume. Uh, you might be a bodybuilder and obviously volume is important to you. Doing heaps of volume and you never really got into those lower rep ranges. You never did singles, doubles, triples, anything under five, okay? You do four training blocks and let's say like 20 weeks later, you decide to test your one rep max again. Your first one rep max, I think I said 170 kilos, did I say? Let's just say I said 170 kilos. Your one rep max before all that volume was 170. You test your one rep max after, and you might actually find it's only 165 kilos. Okay, that might not necessarily happen, but I'm just giving you an example that if you don't train in those lower rep ranges, or anything around your one RM, that you, your 1RM may not actually go up a whole lot. Or maybe, sorry, the, maybe the better example that I could have give that you tested 170 at the start and then you're 170 at the, at the end. Or it might be just really small, you know, maybe you just added, say, 5 kilos to your 1RM. You've done all this training and you expect that your 1RM was going to get a lot higher, but it doesn't. Again, going down to this last point, Training specificity, so the rep range that you regularly train at is the rep range that you are going to get strong at, generally. Okay, so if you commonly, if you always do fives, you're probably going to be really good at doing fives. So if you were going to test your five rep max and you always do five, you might find that if you tested back to that First example, if you did a 5RM before all that volume and you and you and you do a lot of five reps in that, you know, those four volume blocks I was talking about, then you did your 5RM again at the end of those training blocks, you might find your 5RM went up by like 20 kilos, but your 1RM only went up by like two and a half or five kilos, okay? Um, so strength is specific to the rep range that you were training at. Uh, so that is a thing to consider when you are testing your strength. So you don't, as I said, you don't necessarily always have to perform a 1RM test. You can still measure progress using more of these rep ranges and it should probably be more specific to your goals and the type of training that you do. Obviously for power lifters, they're interested in getting their 1RM rep, one RM up and this is kind of what they're going to be testing, well basically when they're doing powerlifting comps. But for the bodybuilders, those doing higher reps, you're probably going to be better off doing more of these kind of like 5RM, 3RM type testing. So, when should you test your strength? So, this is, you have to weigh up the considerations between fatigue and the importance of testing. So, what I mean by that, when you do all out maximum effort te testing, in particular, if you were testing a few exercises, either you're doing it all in a single day, like for a, for a powerlifter doing like a squat, squat, bench press, or deadlift, or if you're doing a body build, a bodybuilder, you might be doing like a squat, bench press, deadlift, you might be doing a, a, a bent over row, an overhead press, you might be doing a whole range of exercises. Testing all those in one day is going to generate a lot of fatigue. Test, testing that even in the week, if you split up, split them up over the week, uh, that's going to be a little bit fatiguing as well. So you have to um, consider that if you are testing before a deload, okay, so you've done your, your training block, it's a, I don't know, it's a five week training block, and you've got your deload on week six, and you're going to test on week five. So something to consider: if you're doing the final week before the deload, it may not be your true strength due to the fatigue which has accumulated over all those weeks. Because fatigue is kind of compounding; it adds up, and that's why we do the deload to clear fatigue, so that we're fresh, either or a taper, so we can test out our strength or prepare us for a new training block. So if you do it before a deload, it may not be your, your max strength due to fatigue. However, it will provide you a ballpark figure 
of where you're at. And also the other thing to consider, if you're always testing like that week before the deload, if you're consistently doing it like that, that's fine because you're doing it under the same circumstances. Okay, so if you're always testing on that final week, you're always going to have like a very similar amount of fatigue by that end of that training block. So it's going to be a very reliable measure because you're always doing it at the same time versus if you do kind of like one test and you do it at the uh, the final week before a deload, but then your next test you do it after a taper. Well, obviously the week that you did before testing before you deload is probably your strength is going to be a lot lower relative to if you did a test when you're fresh after a taper. And then pretend, let's say for the next testing, you did it again before the deload, okay? You might find your strength isn't much far, further up or might be the same uh, relative to that test you did after the taper, okay? So it's going to fluctuate depending on, you know, what fatigue is around and when you, when you, um, what part of the uh, training block, you know, is it after or before the deload. Um... The positive of training before the deload is, as I said, that when you are doing maximum effort testing, you are going to... It's it's fatiguing, okay? Uh, if you do it in that final week before the deload, and then you're doing a taper... or Sorry, if you're doing a deload um, after your testing, well, then you're going to be resting after your, your testing. So the fatigue from the testing isn't going to carry over to your next training block, all right? So doing it before on that final week of the deload, you won't have fatigue carrying over to the next training block. Now, if you decide to test after a deload, you might do this if you need a true max effort test. So do you need to know what is your true strength when you have no fatigue uh, accumulating? then you're probably best doing your testing after a deload rather than before. Maybe someone is doing a mock meet. So they um, they want to kind of get a taste of what it's like to do a powerlifting comp. I might have a client who I'm trying to kind of get them to used to what uh, getting kind of like experience, kind of like what a powerlifting comp is going to be like. So... In that case, I'll run like a taper, and then we'll do a bit of a mock meet uh, after after the deload. And as I said, the downfall is that, again, if you're testing multiple exercises, this is going to generate a lot of fatigue, and it may take almost the entire week after that, de after that testing to, to clear that, that fatigue. Okay, so you're going to do your testing, then you're going to have to wait, say, a week to clear all that fatigue, and then you're going to have to, then you will start kind of your next kind of training block. So that that week, so if you were to deload, test, and then you need another easy week, it's kind of like you've almost done kind of like two deloads. So that's a week of training, of overloading training that you could be doing, but you need to spend another week uh, or maybe it might be less, might be like five days. But anyway, there's going to be extra days which have to be spent on recovering from your your testing. And then from that, if you were just to do your deload and then test, okay, straight after the deload, and then straight after testing, you go straight into a next training block. If you don't give yourself time to clear that fatigue that you generated from testing, well, then that fatigue might still be, or most likely will be lingering around if you jumped straight into a next training block. So what's going to happen is you got this fatigue from testing, then you start the next training block, then you're going to accumulate fatigue from your next training block, and then the fatigue is just going to compound, and that just might ruin the whole rest of the, the, the training block. Okay, so that is something to consider if you're going to test after the deload. Uh, and just last thing on, on testing, how often should you test? So with the beginner, uh, that progress is going to be a lot quicker. 
and you'll probably see some sort of improvement if they did some sort of 1RM, 3RM, 5RM testing kind of every 8 weeks, you'll probably see them getting stronger. Um, however, obviously with beginners, you shouldn't be testing unless your technique is, is good. Uh, so that's only relevant for people who have pretty good technique uh, and is a beginner. You could get away with testing more often and you'll probably see some sort of progress. Someone who's more experienced, it's going to take a lot longer to bring out or to show progress. So for someone with more experience, I'd probably recommend at least kind of 16 weeks before for testing for like is particular true like maximum effort testing, like all out. Um, you might be disappointed if you were kind of testing more frequently because you might see if you did like if a... A experienced lifter tested kind of every eight weeks. It might not lot. It might not even be long enough to to see improvements in strength in eight weeks. What you might do two volume blocks, and you haven't even done a strength block yet. So you wouldn't even have time for your your um, one RM strength to to go up. So for more experience, I would drag it out a little bit further. And then again, going back off that fatigue. So if a, a beginner doing testing relative to their body weight, so if they if they can if they're squatting say one and a half times their body weight, the amount of fatigue, the amount of stress on their body is going to be a lot lower relative to if you get some like elite level powerlifter who can do triple body weight squats. To recover from that triple body weight squat, so the fatigue that triple body weight squats is going to put on an experienced lifter is going to be a lot larger. So if you were doing frequent testing as an experienced person, again, you've got to have this fatigue. You're going to be spending time clearing this fatigue, which that time can be better spent doing overloading training. So over the long term, you can be improving your strength or even improving your your muscle mass, okay? So going from that, so we had the problem of generating too much fatigue or a lot of fatigue from doing kind of these all out strength tests, but you don't have to always do an all out RPE 10 test. It does not have to be a maximum effort test. Again, this can be both um, before a deload or after the deload. You can work up to some heavy singles at like an 8 RPE, a 9 RPE. Um, from that, what you can do is, if you got a, if you got a, if you did a single at an 8 RPE or a 9 RPE, you can use an estimated 1 RM calculator, which I'm, I'll go show um, in future slides, uh, and then that will kind of guesstimate where your 1 RM is. Uh, again, you can do that for like a three RM. You might be, you might do a a, a three RM test at an eight RPE. Okay, or might do a five RM test at a eight RPE. All right. So with that, it's going to be, as I said, less fatiguing because you're not going to all out maximum effort. There's going to be less chance of injury, so obviously the more closer to failure you're going, the more, the higher intensity, the greater chance that your technique, that you'll get technical breakdown, uh, so that's going to increase the chance of injury. However, if you'd be a bit more submaximal, there's less chance of getting an injury. And then, as I said, you can still have a, you can still have a pretty good estimate of where your strength is if you use some sort of uh, estimated 1RM uh, calculator. A consideration to do if you are going to use some maximal these lower RPEs or higher repetitions. So, if you wanted to know what your your well, that's sorry, that's what the estimated one RM calculator is because we're trying to find out your your one RM. The higher the rep range is, greater from one from your one rep max. The higher the rep ranges and the lower the RPE, so the further away you are from failure, the less accurate the 1RM estimation is going to be. So that's something to consider if you're using multiple repetitions uh, and these lower sub-maximal RPEs if 
you wanted to find out what your estimated 1RM is, but if you not really concerned about this, and as I said, you could just be measuring progress, you know, is my five reps going up because you might be a bodybuilder or a physique athlete or just interested in just muscle hypertrophy, 1RM strength is not really concerned to you, then you don't really need the estimated 1RM. If your five RMs are going up over time, using these submaximal um, tests, then that's that's fine. So the next one is, you can do a AMRAP set. So this is kind of similar to what I was talking about doing a 3RM or like the 5RM test. So you might do at the final week of a, of a training block, or maybe you might do it every second training block. You can build up to a submaximal AMRAP set. So you might be on that, that last um, week of training, you're doing saying, uh, you've got a set of five on squats and you're doing like 150 kilos. So then rather than stopping at the five, you just keep going and see how many reps you can get and stop about you know one or two reps short uh, before failure. Why I say one or two reps short? Because I think if you do it like a 10 max all the way, max one, you again, you run into that risk of injury, especially if you're doing multiple repetitions. Well, with a one rep max, you've got one chance of getting an injury. All right. If you're doing like an AMRAP of like 10, say, those first few reps might not be as risky, but once you get to set, you know, rep 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you've just increased your risk of injury by like another five times because you're doing a whole bunch of extra reps, okay? Um, so if we cut out kind of like those true max effort ones, we're going to reduce the, the risk of injury. We can stay a little bit more sub-maximal. Um... Again, you can do the AMRAP test. I said you can do it uh, at the end of the training block. You can do it after a deload, but again, you have to consider the fatigue and the carryover effects of what I talked about in the previous slides. Um, with the AMRAP, so you can do it in two ways. You can do it a final set AMRAP. So if you've got three sets of five on a, on a squat, you might do set one for the five reps, set two for the five reps, and then the final set, set three, then you do your AMRAP set on that. The downfall of that is you may have fatigue from set one and set two, which is going to affect what you, the reps you may achieve on that final set. Then the other way, you might do a first set AMRAP set. So if you still, you know, you're just doing, you're still doing your usual training block or your, your, your training week. So you're not just doing like an AMRAP week, you're still doing an AMRAP, but with the rest of your training. For the first set, you might do the AMRAP, and then sets two and three, you do your usual, whatever the program said, that five sets on, five reps on the, the squat. But then, something you have to consider, if you're doing an AMRAP set on that first set, but still need to get volume in, the fatigue on that, from that first set, may affect the volume in the following set. So something that's to consider. But what you're doing with your MRAP sets, again, be consistent with how you do it, whether you're doing it on like the final set of the exercise, the first set of the exercise, after a deload, before a deload, be consistent in how you do this, and then maybe make up some kind of like Excel spreadsheet document, so then you can compare uh, your AMRAP sets between um, every testing that you, you did that. And then from that, so when you're doing an AMRAP test, uh, I think it's better to aim for like a rep range. So you might be saying, I want to pick a weight that I can AMRAP between say five to 10 reps. So rather than be like, you know, last AMRAP I did a hundred kilo squat and I did seven reps and that might've been like three months ago. And then, so now I'm going to use a hundred kilos again and then do an AMRAP set on that. I probably won't do that because what you'll find is, you, you, well, for one thing, you're probably going to do a lot more reps. Uh, if your program is good, your nutrition's right, you're probably going to knock out a, a whole, you know, extra reps. 
the, and this is more for like if you're getting those really high rep ranges because once you start getting like over say eight, nine, tens, eleven, twelves, it gets to a bit of a point where it's like that you are just getting gassed out because you're doing really high reps and also that there's more chance of kind of technical breakdown because as I said you've got more repetitions, you've got more uh, exposures to make an, an error if you're doing a lot of repetitions. So what I suggest doing is kind of like have some sort of a rep range. I probably would have done lower than 10 actually. You might have a rep range, you might have some like, you know, say you aim to do a AM rap with a particular weight somewhere around like three to seven reps and you're going to do a few warm-ups and then you will pick a weight that you think that you can be around that three to seven rep mark. And then what you can do, you can compare the data. So if you did 100 kilos by, and you did five reps on that AM rep set, but then next time you do 110 kilos and you do six reps on that AM rep set, then obviously the weight has gone up plus you have done an extra rep. So other ways that we can track progress, we don't necessarily have to do strength trust testing. We can actually check our progress by seeing if training volume is going up over time. So, to obviously if training volumes, to, to see if training volume is going up over time, you have to track it. So you're best off doing this in Microsoft Excel uh, for, if you're not, a, not aware, uh, to get the training volume calculation, you're just timing sets by reps by load. So if you're doing, for example, three sets of 10 repetitions of 100 kilos on your squats, then the total training volume of that session is going to be 3,000 kilos. All right, so that is how we can track training volume. As I said, you're going to have your core exercises which you are tracking, the core exercises which are always in your program. So you can compare you can compare the, um, sorry, you can, yeah, you can compare training volumes from like, say, at the start of the year relative to the the end of the year. You know, has training volume gone up over over the year? So you can look at the training volume, uh, as I said, for the individual exercises, or if you've got, say, those four or five exercises which you're always doing in your program, what you can do as well is because some may go up, some might go down. It's kind of going to be very wavy, but you can add all the training volume. So all the training volume for one year of your squat, uh, your bench press, your chin ups, your overhead press, whatever. You're getting all of that, and then you are you're getting a sum total. Okay, sorry, I was meant to say not over the year, over the over the week you're getting a sum total of the training volume of your whatever the exercises are. So if you add your squat volume, bench press volume, chin up volume, shoulder press volume, all that volume, what's the sum of that? And then you can add that, then you can see it each week. And then you can see over the year is the total training volume of all your exercises going up. Okay. So Basically, you can look at training volume as an individual exercise and the total volume that you've been doing. Uh, something to consider as well. So when you're tracking training volume, <clears throat> training volume, I'm going to go show you in a sec. It's going to be, it's going to go very up and down. Okay. If you're doing a volume block, so or accumulation phase where the purpose is to accumulate training volume, Training volume is going to be a lot higher and training volume will be going up in those phases. But then for, for a powerlifter, if you're doing a, a, you know intensity block or you're prepping for a, a, a meet or just a, a, a bodybuilder, you're doing a strength block. So there's the inverse relationship between intensity and, and training volume. So if you're doing higher intensities, you're generally going to do lower training volumes. And if you're doing lower intensities, you're doing higher training volumes. So in these intensity strength blocks, your volume might actually dip and be a lot lower relative to these volume blocks. However, if you start getting all this data 
and then you can see like you know you've got your accumulation accumulation volume block then you've got accumulation 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 um sorry so it's meant it's meant to say accumulation accumulation strength block not volume accumulation accumulation strength block accumulation accumulation strength block you can compare so coming down here, you might be able to compare the volume from one strength block that you did a few months ago to the next strength block if you like now. You can compare volume from your accumulation blocks to your accumulation blocks. You'll see these patterns, which I'll go over in a, um, in a sec. Actually, I'll go over them right now. So this is 25 weeks of training these are kind of arbitrary somewhat arbitrary numbers i kind of made up just to give you an idea so this is for the squat we've got accumulation blocks deloads intensity blocks okay just looking at just look at this middle section here so this is the tonnage all right we can see over the weeks that tonnage is going up for the deload obviously volume decreases then the volume increases, deload. For this intensity block, because the training intensity, as we can see, they're working between, you know, this 82 to 90% in this intensity block, whereas in this accumulation block, they were working at lower intensity. So as I said, there's an inverse relationship. If you're doing high intensities, you have to do lower volumes, as we can see here. If you're doing lower intensities, you can do higher volumes. And then if you look at here, this is exactly what's happening. So these are the volume blocks. We can see the volume over time. This was that first training, that first block here. Got peak volume of close to four ton. We did the deload. Then we started ramping up volume again. Peak volume by the end of this got to 4.2 ton. Then we did the deload. However, now here, this was an intensity block. Volume was still kind of increasing within that, but at a lower, but obviously it's a lot lower relative to here. Because with here, obviously we're still getting stronger each week. Um, let's say sets has stayed the same, reps has stayed the same. Maybe you're doing like four sets of threes on your lifts, okay? But you're getting stronger each week, so then the volt, then the volume might be going up a little bit. However, coming to this next intensity block here, the volume dropped again because maybe here they're only doing like singles and and doubles. Okay, so the volume is going to be a lot lower. However, I forgot to mention this. You can see the intensity is going up. This shows that inverse relationship. If intensity is high. Training volume is generally low. If intensity is low, training volume is generally high. But going off this, I've only got one intensity block, but we can compare the accumulation blocks. I said in the last slide that you can compare training block types. Okay, you can compare accumulation with accumulation blocks or strength blocks with strength blocks. If we look at these accumulation blocks, look at these ones here. So the peak volume in this accumulation block we got to 4.2 ton but then the peak volume of this accumulation block got to 4.6 ton which we can visually see here so that's what i mean by comparing block types if this went further and we compare the intensity block type we might see that that was going up as well and then again i talked about the total training volume so this this example here I was just, um, in Excel, this was summing someone's squats, bench press, and deadlift together, and then that's why the tonnage is very high. Again, it done that same wave-like um, pattern, just like on the squat, and, it, and I did the average intensity. So in this one, I, this was the average intensity of someone's squat, okay? But in the Excel document, I had a squat, and then I had another a deadlift um, column, and then a bench press, and that all had average intensity. So then I got the average. So for week one of your squat, deadlift, bench, I got the average intensity of all those three, and that's how I got this intensity here. Okay? Um, but we're talking about volume. Don't too, I'm jumping, 
going on a side tangent. Anyway, again, you can see the trend of volume is going up over time. So basically going off that, if you see training volume is going up over time, which it should be, well then there's a there's this relationship with training volume and muscle hypertrophy. If training volume is going up over time, especially over you know six months, twelve months, eighteen months, if training volume is going up, you're most likely getting muscle. There is a bit of a relationship too with strength and training volume. If training volume is going up, if you're doing a lot more training volume like here, if you're doing from 8 ton and now you're doing 11 ton here, or 13 ton, sorry I'll go and look at these accumulation blocks. Doing from 8 ton to 13 ton, there's a good chance you're a lot stronger now. Even if you're not doing one rep maxes, even if this is just a, a bodybuilder, and the lowest they go is five, doing their like five rep maxes. If they were to test their one rep max here and test their one rep max here, there's probably a good chance that they got stronger because they're doing a lot more training volume. Going off that, if your training volume is the same, if it's been six months and your training volume is just kind of like a flat line or it's going down, then there's a good chance you're getting weaker. There's a good chance that you are losing gains. There's a good chance that you are not making progress. If that's going down, there's something wrong with your training program. Maybe you're doing too much volume. Maybe you're doing too little volume. Maybe you're in the deficit for too long. Whatever the reason might be. Uh, but that's why it's important. Or well, Actually, no, I'll say it's important. That's why it's important to track, tra uh, track training volume over time to see are you progressing is that going up because over time training volume should be probably be one of the most important things that should be going up in particular for people who want to gain uh muscle size another thing that you can look at with training volume so if your training is if your training volume is going up over time but you uh you've got around the same amount of fatigue so let's say Week four, all right, whatever the amount of fatigue that you were, if you were rating fatigue at like a an, an eight out of ten, say, of how fatigued you are, but then you come down here and now you're doing almost 14 ton, but you're still rating your fatigue at an eight out of ten, well then your work capacity has improved. You're getting the same amount of fatigue for what about two two and a half thousand more kilos of training volume same fatigue but more training volume there's a good chance that you are progressing and your work capacity is improving with that with your fatigue maybe to check that to see because you're probably gonna forget especially if you're not logging it what was my fatigue on X amount of training volume six months ago relative to whatever my training volume is now and what my fatigue is? Maybe in your program you can keep maybe a, a training diary. So with my clients each week, they give me a rundown of how that week went. They tell me how was strength, how was motivation, um, any niggles or pain, how was fatigue. Um, and then with that, you might, you'll probably find that even just writing down a diary, you will start to develop this pattern in your head of how your fatigue was at particular points of the training block. You can also go back through your diary and just look at your training fatigue and match it and write the training volume that you were doing at the time. So you can match what your uh, subjective ratings were or your qual uh, qualitative data that you were writing down you can match that to your training volume so that you can match up your fatigue to the training volume that you've been doing um and then with that to quantify fatigue maybe you just might do a simple one to ten scale on your program of fatigue okay put that on your program uh make it something meaningful to you, you might even do a one to five scale okay 
uh, each week you can log your fatigue so then you can compare as I said earlier training blocks with X amount of training volume look at what fatigue score you would give those training blocks and then six months from now what training volume are you doing what's your fatigue range that you were giving your training now is your vo has your volume gone up and fatigue is staying around the same level over time then as I said your work capacity is probably improving over time even though you uh, got the same fatigue but handling more training volume um, the next one so I talked about this briefly before so your estimated 1RM so Based from your weight, reps, and the RPE that you score, you can get an estimated 1RM. So, I, would, I was talking about that I had an Excel document um, that did that. So, there is a formula in Excel. There's a website. If you just go to... Uh, if you Google RPE calculator, you can get that. If you want to... Imp I implement this in my program, so it does this all for me. But if you did, say, five reps and you did 120 kilos, and you rated that at a two repetitions in reserve, or that be an 8 RPE, that is going to give you an estimated 1 RM. All right. So over time, what I would have someone's uh, program, when they are logging, so imagine this is just um, set one. So in the, I've, I just cut this... Um, I just hid everything just to make this clear for this. But if you got set one, set two, set three, you got a bunch of sets that they've logged, you get an estimated one RM. Then you've got week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six. You'll get a whole bunch of estimated one RMs, and then you can see the trend over time. Is that going up? So is there one RM going up over time, which I'm going to show you in a sec. Sorry, I jumped ahead. There is a, a Bryce Lewis video on YouTube. If you go to go to YouTube and type in, I think if you type in Bryce Lewis E1RM, the video might come, come up. Or if you just go to Bryce Lewis YouTube, type in Bryce Lewis, go to his YouTube channel, go through his videos and just scroll through the videos he's posted. That It's a little bit old now, I think it's a couple of years old. He goes through the formula in how to create that in Microsoft Excel. That's how I learned to. I watched this video and then I made the formula in Excel and then I use it in my programs. So, as I said, you can track 1RM over time. If your estimated 1RM is going up over time, then you're probably getting stronger. Even though you might not be doing a test, you might be not testing your one rep max. Okay, this is just from your training logs because as I said, you're going to be logging your training. This week you did 5 reps, 100 kilos, and a 3 repetitions reserve. Next week you did 5 reps at 100 and 2.5 kilos at 2.5 repetitions in reserve. You logging that, again, you're going to be getting, over time, a whole bunch of estimated 1R rent, and then you can see if that's trending over time, which I will show you now. So, going back to this same... Um, Excel sheet that I used before with the volume. Now I added the extra, we got the 1RM. Look, whatever this person logs for, this is, so the estimated 1RM, I'm going to do what is the best that they did for that week. So if you're doing like four sets of squats, as your sets, as you do more sets, your repetition in reserve is going to get closer to your max. And then, so that's going to make your 1RM go, estimated 1RM smaller. Sorry, just to show what I meant by that. If we rated this, if we did 5 reps with 120 kilos and we rate that as a, as a 2 repetition reserve, then that was pretty easy because you rated it as a 4. Your estimated 1RM is at 157, okay? If we rate that same lift, but it's only a 2 repetitions in reserve, you can see that drop to 148. So again, if you're doing multiple sets and this repetition in reserve or your RPE um, is getting harder and harder, then this is going to drop more and more. So what I'll be doing, I'll be getting the, the 
the highest estimated 1R RAM out of all, all the sets. And that is why on... Oh, sorry, I should have done it from the current slide. That is why on this, I've only just got a single estimated 1R RAM because it was the best of the week, okay? So going back to what I was saying, you can track your estimated 1R RAM over time. It may fluctuate, it might may go up and down, all right? But over time, we will, we want to put a, a trend line, sorry, that is, um, that was the wrong one, sorry, this one. Your estimated 1RM might be going up and down over time, but if we put a trend line in, is that improving, okay? Because some weeks, you're going to be stronger than others. You might have deload. So deload, you're going to drop the intensity a little bit. You're going to be working at lower repetitions and reserve. Your estimated RM is going to go down in those deload weeks. Well, it's going to look like it's going down, okay? But then you start back up and it creeps back up. Uh, other things that your estimated 1RM might be lower. It might look lower in these accumulation phases because you're working at lower intensities and you're working at lower repetitions in in reserve all right so your adaptations might not be so that your, your adaptations from training might not be increasing your estimated one rm too much but then when you come to these intensity blocks where you were training with higher intensities you might find that like here you estimate um, you get this kind of bigger increase when you're doing more intensity type stuff but basically what I'm trying to point out is that your estimated 1RM is going to fluctuate up and down over the months. But if we track this over multiple weeks and then we see that over time it is going up. Well, this is a good indication that you are getting stronger without even having to do a 1RM test. Alright, so that's another way to tra track progress without even testing your max. Alright, so another thing that you can do, I think this is the last thing I had to cover, was that you can just compare RPEs or repetition reserve. You're just comparing RPE from previous training blocks. So if you're doing the same load from a previous training block, okay, but you're doing it, if you're doing, a, a, a set, if you did, sorry, I'll just, I'll just do it, jump ahead. If you're doing 150 kilos by three reps at the end of a training block, I oh know two training blocks ago, you got to 150 kilos, you did a three, and you did that at a nine RPE, okay? But you know, in the f now you're doing 150 kilos by three, but now you're raining that at a seven RPE. Well, you're doing the same weight for the same reps, but at a easier RPE. Well, then that is a good sign that you are getting stronger as well, or that you're progressing, or that even you're building muscle. Because, again, which I said at the start of this video, if your performance is going up over time, well, then that's a good sign that you are probably gaining muscle, particularly if you were doing over a whole bunch of rep ranges. So if you're doing squats, if you're three rep squat, six rep squat, a rep squat, if you're doing the same loads, but you were rating that at lower RPEs over a whole range of rep ranges, that's a probably good sign that you are gaining muscle as well. So, again, you could just compare RPEs from week to week. You're going to be looking, seeing your RPEs change as well, training block to training block. And again, you can compare RPEs from similar weights and reps and then you're comparing from training to training block are the rpes easier at the same way in the reps again good sign that you're getting that you you were getting stronger you're gaining muscle and just overall getting progress um so with that just like i was said for the tracking training volume tracking your estimated one rm and comparing rpe you don't always have to take tests. You don't always have to test your maxes to see if you're progressing. There's other things, there's other, there's other data that you can be collecting to see if you are progressing. 
So just to summarize everything I've talked about, as I said at the start, make sure you have a select few exercises that you are always doing in your training program. If you're always changing your exercises, or you don't have exercises which you are not regularly doing, well, as you saw with all the tracking methods that we were doing, if you don't have that same exercise there, how are you gonna make a comparison? You can't compare your dumbbell bench press to your barbell bench press. Okay, they're two totally different things. The, the training volume is gonna to be totally different. The estimated one RM is gonna be totally different. So you can't compare those two together. Has to be exercises which you're always doing. A method that you can track progress, again, we talked about strength testing, 1RM, 3RM, 5RM. You don't necessarily always have to do a 1RM test. Test specifically to your goal. So if you have no interest in going, if training this low in reps is a waste of your time, if you're a bodybuilder, probably going to be a little bit of waste of your time doing, you know, heavy, a lot of like really heavy stuff. You're probably going to get your best bang for your buck when you're in this higher rep ranges. So test specific to your goals. Use the common rep ranges. Test for the common rep ranges that you're using. Um, then, you know, again, for a powerlifter, they'll be doing more of this 1RM stuff. Um, these higher, sorry, lower rep range stuff. Um, from the sub strength testing, again, you can do some max strength testing. You don't have to do an all out max effort test. Um, you can stop at like 8 or 9 RP. This is going to be less fatiguing and less chance of injury. Um, we had the AMRAP sets that we were talking about. So that was just picking like a rep range of doing like say 3 to 7 reps. Picking a load and just how many reps can you do on that load. Um, we had the tracking of volume that you can do in Microsoft Excel. Uh, the estimated 1RM tracking again doing in uh, Microsoft Excel, or you can compare RPE from feet, uh, previous training blocks or even week to week to see if you're lifting the same load for the same amount of reps, but the the rating of that your RPE is a lot lower, whether well, that's a good chance, that, well, that's a, not even a good chance, that's a pretty good sign that you were getting stronger, uh, potentially gaining muscle, but overall, you're getting progress. So that is the end of this little presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please send me a message in the comments. Uh, message my Instagram, Facebook. If you're watching this on YouTube, just use leave a comment on YouTube. Um, and... As I said in all my videos, I appreciate if you share these around. These take me quite a while to prepare. Uh, the more people that see it, the better. The more motivated I will be to make uh, more of these type of videos. Um, so that's it. I will see you all again soon.